Now we come to chapter 23, and the young man is getting ready to graduate from college, from the School of Wisdom. And I think that we'll have a graduation ceremony when we get over at the end of chapter 24. But now here in chapter 23 that we come to, we have this word given in the first three verses. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider well who is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Well, I can put it in very commonplace language. Don't make a pig of yourself when you're invited out to eat. And especially if you're invited in a place and you find out that there's put before you gourmet food and the type you're not accustomed to eat, well, don't make a little pig of yourself. In fact, it would be better, he says, that you cut your throat rather than to make a pig of yourself. In other words, be temperate in all things, Use moderation, self-control, even when you eat. And they found out, at least they say they have, that this compulsion to eat on the part of some folk is not real hunger, but it's a psychological factor. A man under great tension, a man that's uptight. In other words, when you go to a meal, be relaxed and enjoy it, but don't make a pig of yourself. That is the whole thought there. Now, verse 4 and 5, this is all very practical. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. And you probably notice that there is an eagle on our dollar. And believe me, that eagle will take off if you're not very careful and fly away, and I find out on my dollars that that eagle takes off all the time. But you can't depend on riches. And the whole thought here is this. There's nothing wrong in being rich, and there's nothing wrong in working to be rich. But don't make that the goal of life. Don't make wealth the very object of your heart. Some man just have a lust, a thirst, it's covetousness, just to want to make the almighty dollar, and that is their God. Now, he says you are not to do that as a child of God. I had many years ago in a church I served back east a man that was a wealthy man, and he always put it like this. He said, I do not make money for the sake of money. I make money for what it can do. And he says... And I make it now. I didn't at first. I made it at first for what it could do for me. Now, he says, I make it for what it can do for God. Now, actually, there was nothing wrong in making it to do for himself in those early days, because there's nothing wrong in a man becoming wealthy. The thing is that when that becomes the overweening desire of the heart, and that's covetousness, and actually, that's modern idolatry. And on Sunday, you don't find many people worshiping idols. But here in Southern California, on Monday morning, these freeways fill up with men and women on the way to work. They worship the almighty dollar, and they're out after it. I had a church in downtown Los Angeles in the financial district. And there were certain men, in fact, there were certain Christian men. They were more zealous in coming down on Monday morning and watch that stock market open than they were Sunday morning in coming to church. In fact, I met a man one time. I hadn't seen him in church in several weeks. And Monday morning, he was on the way down to a broker to where the stock market's on display. And he met me. He was very cordial. He told me what he's going to do. And I said, well, we've been missing you at church. He said, well, you know, I haven't felt well. Well, that's interesting. He didn't feel well enough to come to church. But his God, really, the one he worshipped, he was able to worship that one. That's covetousness. And that's what he's talking about here. And that's a false God, because that false God's an eagle that'll fly away any time. And you'll never see that again. 
Now we have here, and this is good advice, I would say it especially to a young preacher, verse 6, "...eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart's not with thee. The morsel which thou hast eaten shalt thou vomit up, and thou wilt have wasted thy sweet words." Now, I have been warned on several occasions by ministers that I go and have a conference with them. They say to me, now, do you want to go out for dinner? Well, my rule now is, no, I'd much rather to have the time that I have, have it to myself, or if I have personal friends. And then sometimes the preacher will say, now, you will be invited to dinner by so-and-so, but you be very careful if you go there what you say because they are name-droppers, as you will find out. And what they want to know, they're going to ask you, they will, they always do certain questions. And they will use that actually against you later on. You make some statement, and when you go to have dinner with a person, you assume that person is your very close friend, and that you are being entertained because they love you. And you are relaxed at the meal, and you talk. And I do a great deal of that, you know. And sometimes you say something that can be misconstrued. And I had that unhappy experience not too long ago. And I found out that that couple used certain things that I said about a very personal friend of mine. And actually, I was kidding, because I loved a brother. In fact, he and I played golf together. And he said to me, what was it you said about me? And I told him what I said. And he laughed. I mean, he says, but you know, he said, they gave it a little twist. But he says, you know, I went over to see them, and I discovered that what I said about you will be coming back to you. And do you know it did? He kids me, too, you know. And so he made some statement, and kidding, and my, they have twisted it. And actually, I would warn anyone about that type of thing. That's what Solomon says, when you have an invitation for dinner, make sure who you're going out with, because it may not be as cordial as you think it is. Now, we have again this remark about the old landmark. Be very careful about it, and here it's for the sake of the children that are coming along. If you've lost your faith, Well, you better not pass that on to your children because they'll really pay for it. You had a good background, and with you, they wouldn't have a good background at all and nothing to protect them. And my feeling is, as Dr. Machen once said, he said, America is coasting downhill on a godly ancestry. Now, we saw that crowd. That was my crowd. We had a godly ancestry. Now, my generation didn't give that to their children. And as a result, it's my generation that came along and produced this generation today that we're blaming for everything. Actually, I think we're the ones. We were coasting downhill on a godly ancestry. And these kids just don't have that godly ancestry. And God have mercy on them because of it. Now, let's move on. Because we're talking about this thing. He says, "...withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die." And we've been over that before, and I'd remind you again that Paul adds to that, that when the parent is correct in the child, that you don't do it when you've lost your temper. You don't do it when you're angry. And remember, you are disciplining the child. You're not punishing the child. It has to be discipline for the child. It's no good. It's not punishment. I think the whole thought's been wrong to say to the child, I'm going to punish you. No, I'm going to discipline you, you see. That's the thing. And that's what Paul says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the instruction and discipline of the Lord, are the, actually the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's the thing that is important. Now, he goes on to talk to the young man again. Verse 19, "...hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thy heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, 
among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunken and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe the man with rags. Be careful of the company you keep. Birds of a feather flock together, and evil companions, they do something about what? Produce evil manners, do they not? And that's what he's warning against here. And again, he comes back to this. The boy's ready to graduate from college. And he says, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she's old. Verse 22. Now your parents are getting old, and your father may be a square, and he may be getting senile. But, my friend, he has lots more sense than you've got. And if you want to know the example of that, if you could only talk to Absalom today... He'd tell you that his dad had more sense than he had. He thought he could rebel against David. Oh, David was a war horse. When that boy moved out to the battlefield, he made a mistake. He should never have left Jerusalem because David knew his way around on the battlefield. <laughs> and it was fatal for that boy. He would have done well to listen to his father, although David was not really a good father. But... He can sure advise that boy about the battlefield. Now, verse 23, buy the truth, sell it not. And you deny today, don't have to buy. Come and buy without money and without price. Buy wine and buy milk and buy water and buy wisdom, by the way. And Christ is all of that for the child of God today. I tell you, this is quite wonderful. It was a brilliant young man. I wish he was here to tell you, but he did tell us, did he not? And that was Paul. He was Rabbi Saul, you remember. Smart boy. <laughs> but he says, Christ has been made unto us wisdom. How wonderful. Then, verse 26, My son, give me thy heart, and let thine eyes delight in my ways. I know somebody's going to say, Now, Dr. McGee, I've heard you say that God doesn't want your old, dirty, and filthy heart. I still say that. But it says, You're my son, give me thy heart. He's not talking to the unsaved man. He's talking to his son. Talking to one that's been born again, got a new nature. Now he says to the boy, Now I want you to come to me, and I want you to yield yourself to me. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Now if you're in love with him, now he says, give me your heart. <laughs> if you're not why, forget it. I think that would be his word. If you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And now if you have been, you can say, Take my poor heart and let it be forever closed to all but thee. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Now, then in verse 27 and 28, For a harlot, is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Now, if there's anyone that thought that I was wrong about saying the stranger was a harlot, then here we have the two made synonymous, and that would answer that question. She also lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. And there are two men that are evidence of that. Judah, back in the Book of Genesis. Man, that's a sorry chapter that tells his story when he went into a harlot. And then Samson, you'll remember. If he could be here today, he said, I tell you, I found out that a harlot can give a pretty good haircut. And that's what happened to him. Now, verse 29, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath anxiety? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Now, again, we have this warning against this matter of wine. And now we've had the word against wine, women, but there's no song, because at the last it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the heart of the sea, or as one that lieth upon the top of a mask. May I say that this is a warning against wine women, and there'll be no song. What a tremendous proverb. Now, friends, in chapter 24, we've come to the last 
chapter of the Proverbs of Solomon that he wrote and arranged. And after this, we will have some that were arranged by the man of Hezekiah. Apparently, they were Proverbs of Solomon because he made quite a few of them. We only have a very small percentage of those that he wrote. These are tremendous truths that have been congealed and boiled down into a very small compass that can grip our lives and direct us down here. Now, we begin with verse 1, chapter 24, and let me read it. "...be not thou envious of evil men." neither desire to be with them. For their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. Now, this has been before us before. Anything that is important, you find a repetition of it in the book of Proverbs. We've seen that relative to several things. There has been a warning about the abuse of the tongue. For instance, a great deal was said about the tongue, and a great deal about pride, and a great deal about a fool. These are things that are constantly emphasized, and they certainly are translated into life. You find these folk on the sidewalks, not only of New York, but of your town and my town. That's the reason I said you will find a proverb that'll fit every person that you know, and a great many of those in the Bible, as we've already seen. I think you'd find one for everyone. I haven't taken time to call attention to those. But here, I can call attention to the fact that back in the 73rd Psalm, you'll recall that is a psalm not of David, but of Asaph. And David had had the same problem. And again, he said he was envious. In verse 3 of Psalm 73, Asaph says, "...for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked." And not only were they prosperous, he saw that they are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. And not only that, they blasphemed God, verse 9, They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Now, he was disturbed about that. I'm of the opinion you've been disturbed by that. I know I have, as I've looked about me. I remember as a boy, as a poor boy, and I couldn't understand why I had to be a poor boy and work as I had to work, go to work when I was 14 years of age. And I wanted to go to school, and a lot of these other boys, in fact, the matter is, were dropping out of school, and yet they were able to go. And I had a real question mark. And here again, you have that, "...be not thou envious of evil men, neither desire to be with them." Why? Because there is a day of reckoning come. And it was this man Asaph that could say in Psalm 73, Verse 17, "...until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein that God will deal with them." And according to your pattern and mine, there's a great deal of injustice in this world, and there's very little that you and I can do about it. Now, we've been in a generation that has protested everything, and they've attempted to level off a great many things that are in the world. I don't think they've done a bit of good myself. All of this protesting just doesn't solve the problem because the problem is in the heart of man. The heart of man has to be changed. But God is the one that's going to level this thing off someday, and we can trust him to do that. I think you and I need to recognize our place in life, It's going to make us a much happier person if you and I realize God's put me in this particular place, and I am to fulfill a purpose here. And I look at that man over yonder. He is prosperous. He's a wicked man. I don't understand it. And tell God you don't understand it. That's what Asaph did. 
I've told him that a dozen times. I didn't understand it. But the important thing is to go on with him and understand that God's going to work it out. And the Bible is just filled with instances of wicked men that came to a bad end. You begin at the very beginning. You can start out with Cain, and you can come right on down, and you can find this man that we call Lot. And he was a saved man, went down to the city of Sodom and prospered. But there came a day when he wished he hadn't moved there. It was a sad mistake for him to do that. You go through the Word of God, and you can see how judgment has come time and time again. This is a very important statement. Now, we move on here in verse 3 and 4. These two verses are quite wonderful also. It says, "...through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the inner chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches." Now, this is a very wonderful picture of what you and I are to do. We are to do the same thing that a man who builds a house, and then he fills that house with furniture and lovely pictures and tapestries and many lovely personal items and many valuable things. And it's just wonderful to see a home like that, a beautiful home that's wonderfully furnished. Now, may I say that you and I ought to be building us a house down here, a house of wisdom, a house of knowledge. And then we ought to begin in our minds and in our hearts. Ought to be a lovely mansion. And then we ought to fill it with all kinds of wonderful furniture and all kinds of vases and maybe a few vases and beautiful pictures and lovely things. That's what we ought to be doing down here. Study, Paul says to a young preacher, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, that's what you and I are to do down here in filling our hearts and lives with the word of God. Build a lovely home. Fill it with lovely things. You know, it's tragic to see some of the hovels. I was down in South America, and a missionary took me on a visit to some of the homes. And I want to tell you, some of those homes were just what you'd call a lean-to, made out of old boards, some of them decaying, a dilapidated place. And then you'd step inside, and honestly, there was no place to sit. They didn't even have a chair. <laughs> just stood and talked to them, and over in the corner, there'd be an old blanket, looked like a blanket or a sheepskin over that. That's where they slept. There was no bed, and they cooked on the outside. And I thought how tragic that was. Frankly, it made me sick going back. Miss Missionary was used to it, of course, and worked with those people for years. And she recognized the awful poverty, but nothing she could do about it. But she was doing a marvelous work there among those people. But I was sick just thinking of the poverty of those people down there in South America and what they lived in. But friends, up here in North America, I know a lot of Christians that should have spent their lives building a lovely home, that is, spiritually, and filling it with all kinds of wonderful treasure out of the Word of God and that type of a life. And yet, May I say to you, you meet them, and you find out spiritually all they got is a little hovel. And when you look on the inside, oh, the ignorance. There's nothing there. Absolutely, it is bad. I was talking the other day to a group of preachers. They agreed with me on this. I don't know they would say it publicly, but I do. I think the biggest, the biggest tragedy in our churches are the ignorant church members. Oh, do they have a vacant house, little old hovel, and nothing in it. 
That's the tragedy of the hour. Through wisdom is a house builded. Oh, that he might make us wise. Now he goes on to say, A wise man is strong. Yea, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel thou shalt make war for thyself, and in the multitude of counselors there is safety. You have a great many resources and recourses, not only folk that you can appeal to today, but back to the Word of God. I don't believe in this method when you want a decision of just opening the Bible and looking at a verse. That's no good. The Word of God is not a roulette wheel that you turn and just hope it stops at the right place. Now, may I say to you that if you have read about what Moses wrote and Joshua wrote and Samuel wrote and David wrote and Micah wrote and Zechariah wrote and Matthew wrote and Paul wrote and John wrote, and you have all of that, they're counselors, and you can appeal to them at the time you need a decision, you see. We're going to move on down now. I'd love to spend time here. But verse 10, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. (laughs) In other words, he's saying something here, by the way, that's rather important. And it's just simply this. It takes a man to do a man's job. Or, as you've heard the bromide, never send a boy to do a man's work. Never. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. You see, it takes these times of real stress and strain, these times of testing. That's the way God develops our spiritual character, and that's the way that he enables us to grow. It's in that hour of trial that you and I really manifest the spiritual strength that we have. It's a great comfort to know that many of God's men, even when the test came, they turned and ran. You remember when Elijah was so brave yonder on top of Mount Carmel, but word was brought to him that Jezebel was after him and she's going to kill him. And he took out, and I tell you, he ran for the wilderness And when he got down there to Beersheba, he left his servant, and he continued on into the desert, climbed up and under a juniper tree and said, Lord, let me die. And you know, David came to a place in his life when he was so hunted by Saul that he had not a moment's peace. He could say, Lord, I'm hunted like a partridge. And one of these days they're going to catch me. And one of these days I'll be put to death. And he became discouraged. But both of these men in that hour found out that the Lord would and did strengthen them. Oh, this is a very important proverb. Now, verse 11, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? Now, there's somebody you could help. And you know it, and you could help them. And there's many a man that could be a witness. Now, I've talked with a man recently. He feels like he's been responsible for a suicide of a loved one. He said, I knew I should have done this. Well, I'm of the opinion that he should have, but he didn't do it, you see. And God is the one that ponders the heart. And the man's under great conviction because he neglected doing something at a time when he should have done it. But that's gone now, and all he could do is, I told him, all you can do is go to the Lord. Tell him that, Lord, you know that I know now that you knew my position at the time. And I failed. And I've come to you to strengthen me and help me. And I'm sure that he would do that. How wonderful that would be, and it would deliver a man from being overwhelmed, of course, by his grief, because he shouldn't be overwhelmed by that. Now, will you notice verse 16? I'm just lifting out some wonderful verses here now. 
it says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. And seven times the number of completeness means he just keeps on falling. Do you know anybody like that? But he kept getting up. Well, that's Simon Peter. <laughs> and then notice, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. That's Judas. Here are two men that were apostles. And this proverb illustrates both of them. A just man falleth seven times. Well, he'll get up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. And that's what happened to Judas, you see. But this man, Simon Peter, he was constantly falling. We magnify the fact that, you remember the time that he walked on water, we say, oh, Simon Peter failed there. Well, I don't really think he failed because he did walk on the water. It says he walked on the water to come to Jesus. But he got his eyes off of the Lord Jesus onto the water and those waves rolling. I really have great sympathy for him there, and he began to sink. But that wasn't the only time the man fell. That night that the Lord Jesus was arrested, he denied him three times. Again and again and again, this man failed the Lord. But he'd always get up and start out again. When I was pastor here in Pasadena, a man said to me, he said, you know, I have failed so many times, I'm even ashamed to go back to the Lord and tell him again that I've failed and I want to start over again. I said, well, you may be ashamed, but the Lord's not. He's ready to start you out again. And he said, well, how many times do you suppose you can fail and still come back? Well, I said, I don't know. I'm working way up in the hundreds right now myself. And I still go to him. I think that, friends, that is the important thing, that we go back to our Heavenly Father and tell him that we stumble and we got dirty again, and he'll put us right back into service. How wonderful it is to have a heavenly father like that. Now he says, verse 17, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. You know, you hear something bad about somebody, and you haven't really liked them very much. You say, Ma, I'm glad that happened to him. Now, don't tell me you never said that, because human nature is like that. But now God is saying, don't rejoice when your enemy falls. That's not the way to solve any kind of a problem. Why? Lest the Lord see it and it displease him and he turn away his wrath from him. The Lord may turn around and start prospering the man that's your enemy. Then you really will be miserable yourself. So you better not rejoice on that account. Verse 19, it says, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. Somebody said we just read that. Yes, back in verse 1. And why do we have it again? Well, we have it again because it's important. The Lord repeats many things that are given again and again. You notice some of the parables are given and certain of the miracles of our Lord. The feeding of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. When you read it, you'll find that each one adds something very peculiar that is actually peculiar to the Gospel that he wrote. And here, this is something that needs to be repeated. And that's the reason I emphasized it as much as I did. Now, when we come here to verse 23, we have actually a kind of a break here. And it says, these things also belong to the wise. Now, here's something else that the young man should have before he graduates. It's not good to have respect of persons in judgment. Now, if you're going out into life, that is a very important matter, and it is something that's so needed. It's needed today in man in public office. It's needed by employers. It's needed by man in any position of authority. It's not good to have respect of persons in judgment. And he goes on, He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, him shall the people curse, nations shall abhor him. 
And today there's a great deal of that, of commending a wicked man and say that the wicked man is a righteous man. My friend, that's one of the worst things in the world that could take place. And as you move on down through this, it says, verse 29, "...say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. I will render to the man according to his work." Now, again, you remember that in the twelfth of Romans, Paul says, "...avenge not yourself." God says, "...I will repay saith the Lord." How important it is. And then it concludes like this. It says, "...yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want is an armed man." In other words, when the young man now is graduating from school, it doesn't make any difference how much you know. It doesn't make any difference about other things. But if you're a lazy individual, that's going to be the greatest handicap you could possibly have in life. Now, Proverbs 25 brings us to a new section, a new division here in the book of Proverbs. These are Proverbs of Solomon that are set in order by the man of Hezekiah. And we're so told here in the first verse, these are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the man of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. And the Septuagint calls it the friends of Hezekiah, are the ones that collected these Proverbs of Solomon. Now, here we have a very wonderful verse. Verse 2, "...it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter." This is the way the proverb says what the Lord Jesus said, "...search the Scriptures." Paul said, "...study to show yourself approved unto God." a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But the Lord Jesus said, search the Scriptures. And that is the thing that we are to do, to search out a matter. But even then, we need to recognize that there are great many things that God has not revealed to us at all. I doubt whether we'd be able to understand them. They're inscrutable. They are beyond the comprehension of man, as he made it very clear. The heavens are high above the earth. He says, so are his ways and his thoughts that much higher than ours. But therefore, what is revealed, we should study it. We should consider it. And that, I think, is very important for us to keep in mind, because we need to recognize that that we need to search the Word of God. We need to study the Word of God. And the heaven is for height, and the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. You can't understand God's ways. Sometimes you don't understand what our rulers do either, but they probably have justification for it, and they know something that we do not know. Therefore, we are never to sit in judgment upon what God does because of the fact that whatever God does, of course, is right. It is the thing that is the proper thing to do. Now we want to drop on down to verse 4. "...take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the finer. Take away the lawless." From before the king and his throne shall be established in righteousness. The worst thing I think that can happen to any individual is to have an evil advisor, someone that leads you into difficult and trouble and to sin. I thank God for a man in my life that led me away from that, because there was a man that had led me the wrong direction, and then to have another man come along and lead me in the right way. And to think of what that means to a man in high position, a man that makes a decision 
even in business, that would affect a great many employees or a man in government. It would affect a great segment of the population. How important it is to have the right kind of advisors around. Now we are told in verse 6, "...display not thyself in the presence of the king, and stand not in the place of great men. For better is it that it be said unto thee, Come up hither, than that thou shouldst be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen." Remember, the Lord Jesus gave a parable that illustrates this great truth. And he did it because of the fact the religious rulers in his day were paying no attention to this proverb at all. A man gave a dinner, and he invited a great many of his friends to it. He was a great man. But he had certain ones that he wanted to have a very high place. And so when he made the dinner, the dinner bell was rung. There was a mad rush to get the best places at the table. And they almost turned the thing over, I imagine, as they rushed in to get the most prominent places. The Lord Jesus, who was present there that day, apparently waited till everyone else had gone in. Then he said something to them. He said, when you're invited to a dinner, don't try to get the best place you purposely get the lowest place. Then the one that's invited you comes in and sees you taking the lowest place, and you are his honored guest. he say to you, come on up here. Now, maybe someone else said, taken that place. And the host taps him on the shoulder and said, you go down and take the lowest place. This idea of pushing yourself, there are those that are very pushy. We hear that. They're pushy in Christian circles. They're ambitious. They want to get ahead in Christian things. May I say the tragedy is that that is in Christian circles. In the world, you can't maybe blame a man in the business world from trying to get ahead, but not in Christian work. It ought not to be. Then in verse 8, he says, "...go not forth hastily to strive." lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Now again, the Lord Jesus gave a parable. You remember about that. He says, when a king is ready to go forth to war, he ought to sit down and see whether he's going to be able to get the victory. And if he sees that he can't carry on the warfare, then he ought to send an ambassador to make a peace treaty with the enemy. You can't do that. And you have an illustration in life in the Old Testament of this. Remember, King Josiah was a great king, and he led the last great revival that Israel had. There was a great turning back to God under his leadership. But you know, he made one grave mistake. Somehow or another, Just one flaw sometimes spoils the life of an otherwise great man. And Josiah was a great man. Oh, he was outstanding man and a man of God. But you remember when Pharaoh Necho came up to make war, not against Josiah at all, but against an altogether different enemy. And Pharaoh Necho said to Josiah, When he came out against him, he said, Now, look, I didn't come up to fight you. I don't want to fight you. But this man, Josiah, he was a young man. I tell you, he went out to fight. I guess he thought it was the Lord's will. A great many always blame the Lord for what they do, you see, that's wrong. And he lost. In fact, he got in real trouble. Tell the truth, he was killed in the battle. There at Megiddo, where the war of Armageddon will be fought. And this man, Josiah, he made a big mistake by meddling. And he should not, of course, have ever done that at all. That is the thing that the Lord is saying here. Now we find in verse 9, I'm reading it, "...debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself, 
and discover not a secret to another, lest he that heareth it put thee to shame, and thine infamy turn not away. Now, you could cause a great deal of trouble by repeating to your neighbor something about the fact that you've heard a certain thing, but don't tell it to the man down the street. Tell it to your neighbor if he has fault. You'll get in trouble if you begin to talk about your neighbors to other people. Go and talk to them personally. And then here is a lovely verse. It's a very wonderful verse. As apples of gold in pictures of silver, so is a word fitly spoken. Isn't that a lovely one? That is just a beautiful thing. And by the way, the apple here, and maybe I ought to take a moment to say that, the apples of gold. Now, we do have a golden, delicious apple, but apparently the fruit that is referred to here is the orange. And the orange, as well as other citrus, was common and native to Israel. They grow there today some of the finest oranges in the world. And so you find that as being the fruit that evidently is mentioned here. And I tell you, it's a beautiful thing as an orange. Now, somebody's going to say, well, that's because you're in California and you're promoting oranges. Well, oranges at the time that Solomon gave that proverb, they were plentiful in Palestine. And they're being grown over there today. And you will find so many wonderful, as you go through the Word of God, just the right word is being said at the right time by certain individuals. And sometimes it's a good word, and sometimes a word of rebuke. But it was necessary. It's fitly spoken. It fits into the picture. It is the proper thing to say. And that is something that I think most of us ought to pray about, is what we should say at the proper time. And there are a lot of things that we need to recognize that we can just say the wrong thing at the right time. And there's some people seem to have the knack of saying the wrong thing at the right time. And they ought not to probably open their mouth to tell the truth. But when a word is fitly spoken, and I'm sure that you know some dear saint of God that just has a reputation of being able to say the right thing at the right time. There was a dear saint of God in the country in Middle Tennessee years ago that had a reputation of always saying something very nice to the preacher after every sermon. And very frankly, people would linger to hear what she's going to say because there were times they couldn't think of anything good to say about the sermon that they had heard. And so one time they had a visiting preacher, and he was just a little bit worse than any they'd ever had before. And the people, I tell you, were interested that morning. What in the world could she say nice to that preacher about the sermon he preached? And so when she went out, she said to him, Pastor, I want you to know that I did enjoy your sermon because this morning you had one of the most wonderful texts that there is in the Scripture. And believe me, friends, that was a word fitly spoken, and it was just like, oranges that were in a frame, in a picture frame, in a frame of silver. And the orange and the silver blend very well, as you know. Now, we have here verse 12, "...and as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an attentive ear." And you've seen a beautiful earring in a woman's ear. And in our day, we've seen men wearing them, but I never saw one that I thought was attractive. But you have seen a woman wear a beautiful earring. Well, that is the proper thing that reveals the fact that there are times when a person should be reproved. 
and should be rebuked. It's very important to see that because we're living in a day when if you say anything publicly, especially unkind, or people say, my, I tell you, you've lost the individual. You'll never be able to win them. Well, my friend, if they're the right kind of individual, you'll win them. And if they're the wrong kind, you wouldn't be able to win them anyway. And there are times that a reproof should be made. Now, verse 13, "...as the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them who send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters." Now, in that day, they brought down snow from Mount Hermon, and they packed it and brought it down, and in time of harvest, and it gets hot in that land. I tell you, that snow was good. How wonderfully it tasted. Well, that is what a faithful messenger is. No wonder the Lord is going to say to some, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we like to have faithful people. A man wants a faithful wife. He loves his faithful children. He wants faithful employees. If he's a pastor, he wants a faithful staff and a faithful people. And the people want a faithful pastor. Faithful is a very wonderful thing. And it's just like having a good cold drink on a hot day to have someone that's faithful. Now, verse 14, "...whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds and wind without rain." We've had that before. And I used to get, when I was pastor, letters from men that would tell me about how wonderful they were. A man wrote, I remember one time, he said he was an evangelist, he was a Bible teacher, he was a singer, he was a pianist. He could do everything, and he wanted to come hold a meeting. And I read the letter, and the officers of the church began to laugh. And they said to me, why don't you invite him? Why, I said, I'd never invite that man for two reasons. The first reason is, if he's the kind of a man he says that he is, why, after our people here had heard him, they'd never want to hear me again. And I'm not going to invite him. And the second reason is, I have a notion that we have a man here that's boasting of a gift that he does not have. What a picture that is. And that is the picture of the apostates in the last days. You remember Jude describes them in the most vivid language. He speaks of them as being clouds without water, raging waves of the sea, just foaming out their own shame. Now, as we move on down into this passage here, verse 16, "...hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it." Now, may I say to you, in the Old Testament, honey illustrates natural sweetness. There was no honey permitted in the bread or meal offering. And that offering speaks of Christ, speaks of the human Jesus, if you please. And there was no natural sweetness in it. Have you ever met anybody that they're so sweet? You know, they say so many sweet things, almost makes you sick. Well, notice what it says here. Don't take in too much honey, because it'll make you sick at your tummy. Now, verse 17. Oh, this is a good one. Let thy foot be seldom in thy neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee and hate thee. Don't spend too much time at the neighbor's. That's what he's saying here, and that's very important. Or you may overhear sometime a conversation in the kitchen between the lady of the house and someone that's back there and say, I wish that old gossip would go home and stay home. And it's better not to wear your welcome out in a place, you see. That's what he's saying here. Now, in verse 18, a man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. We've had that before us before. Now, verse 19, 
confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. (laughs) Judas was a bad toothache, and he was foot trouble. He was both of them. And there are a lot of folk like that, as you well know. You've met them, I'm sure. Then as we move on down here, verse 21, "...if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee." Now, the Lord Jesus gave that. And also, you find that Paul gives this also. It's very important. Verse 23rd, it says, "...the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue." Now, we are living in a day of sweetness and light, and you're not supposed to rebuke anybody today. Every now and then I get a letter from some lovely saint who rebukes me for being hard on certain groups, not individuals. I'd never single them out, but on certain movements today. Well, may I say to you that I believe that that's what I should do. The north wind driveth away rain, and maybe we need rain, and we always need it in Southern California, and we don't have enough. And when that north wind comes and you know you're not going to get rain, well, that's disappointing. But I'll tell you this, an angry countenance will take care of a backbiting tongue. It'll take care of those that are teaching things today that are wrong, and I think that they should be dealt with. And I intend to continue to speak out when we feel like that it's important to speak out. I feel that this is a very important proverb. It's wonderful to have sweetness and light all the time. But we're living in a world in which there are serpents along the pathway of life. There are pitfalls. There is false doctrine today and false teaching of the Word of God. And I want to do it, speak out, but I hope I do it in a spirit of love and in a sense not to hurt individuals, but to try to give the truth of God today. So, I find ample justification in the Word of God, and here's a verse for it. Now, verse 24, and we've had this up several times, "...it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman and in a wide house." You would think that Solomon, who had so many, must have had a lot of trouble with some of them, with the fact that he wrote these Proverbs. This, of course, was set in order by the man of Hezekiah. And I sometimes wonder if when he went for a ride in the chariot, if maybe he didn't have a backseat driver there. That could have something to do with it, by the way. And again, may I say, verse 26, "...a righteous man falleth down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring." You know, when you're hungry, I should say thirsty, and you can be hungry too, but when you're thirsty, I've had that when I was a boy, go hunting. We never knew what it was to take water with us in any kind of a water container. And we would come to a creek or a fountain, and sometimes it would be limpid water, and in that day, there was no pollution around. But every now and then you would find a spring that had been polluted, the scum on it, green. What a disappointment it is. And he compares that now, that when a righteous man, a man that has stood for things, finally he bows before the wicked. How many times that happens in business? How many times that happens in politics? That a man that has stood for something, in order to get into office, he bows before the wicked. And sometimes it happens in the church even today. A man that has stood for doctrine, he stood for things that are right, but he begins to compromise and cut corners. That is the heartbreak today. It's just like coming on a fountain when you're thirsty and finding it covered with scum and polluted. What a verse this is. And 
then it's not good to eat much honey. So for man to search their own glory is not glory. When you eat too much honey, it's not good for you. A little honey is good for you. But a lot of honey makes you sick. And for a man to be so ambitious, especially in the things of God, be a pusher, well, it makes you sick. In fact, it makes you sick at your tummy to see that type of thing. And, by the way, we see that type of thing around us today, this inordinate ambition among Christians. Now, we'll be back at that when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes later on. Now, the last verse, "...he that hath no rule over his own spirit..." is like a city that's broken down and without walls. A man that cannot, or a woman that cannot, control their emotions, not self-control. And you know that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Now, there is a time for a person to let go, as we've seen. There's time to stand for something and speak out with great emotion. But, my friend, there are times when we need to recognize to control our own spirits. Now, we come to the 26th chapter, and we begin here again with a whole section here that deals with the fool. The Bible has a great deal to say about the fool. Now, what he's talking about is not the man that is mentally deficient. He's not talking about the simple-minded or the one today that has some mental aberration and maybe it needs to be put in an institution. The fool that's mentioned here is a man that may be brilliant. He could have a Ph.D. degree. David put it like this, "...the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God." And it is a man that, though he may be brilliant, yet he is very much of an oddball, and he is an atheist. Now, the Scripture says, and that Hebrew word means insane. He's an insane man. The inner marriage sometimes produces very brilliant offspring, but also there be a mental deficiency. One of the pastors of the church I served in Nashville went way back to the beginning of the church way back in the early days of Tennessee. And he had married into the governor's family there that had intermarried, and as a result, there was insanity in the family. And this man had two daughters, and they were brilliant. But when I became pastor, they were old ladies. They lived way out in the country, way up in the hills of middle Tennessee on a farm. And I was holding meetings in that area, and they wanted me to go by to see them. Well, I went by to see them, and I have never met any two women that were more brilliant than those two women. They knew all about me, all about the church I was serving. They knew the Bible. They knew literature. They were acquainted with music. They were up on current events. i be honest with you, it was amazing. But you know, there was something very odd there. The pastor that took me says, now, don't be surprised at what you see. Well, when we went in, we had to shoo the chickens off of the chairs to sit down, and then you had to be rather careful. And while I was sitting there talking with them, from the kitchen, a cow stuck her head in the door. And there was a horse over in the bedroom. And there were goats around, and you could sure tell them. I never saw them, but you could tell they were there. And that was the thing about them, a mental aberration, you see. Now, there are some today, may be brilliant, but they're atheists. Now, God says that's insanity. Now, he's going to talk about the fool here for several verses. Let's look at it. "...as snow in summer, and as rain in harvest..." So honor is not seemly for a fool. One of the marks of a fool is that he doesn't mind sacrificing his honor, has none whatsoever. Verse 2, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless 
shall not come. In other words, the prediction made that certain things will come to pass doesn't always happen. And by the way, that's something for a lot of these so-called prophets today that are in our midst. They're telling us what's going to happen in the next few years. They may be right. I don't know. They don't get it from the Word of God. Now, will you notice verse 3? A whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. That's a good one, isn't it? Whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass. Got to put a bridle on a little donkey. Well, a fool, the only thing he'll respond to is real discipline. Verse 4. Now we have two verses here that I used to hear as a boy by our town atheist. He always enjoyed pointing out contradictions in the Bible. Here's one of them. Now, will you notice it? Verse 4 says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now, isn't that a contradiction? No, my friend, that's no contradiction at all. That sets before you and me two lines of conduct when a fool speaks. May I say to you that I get letters from different individuals, and I get letters from folk I'd put in this classification. Some of them I answer, some I don't answer. Now, it's not because I can't answer them, but answer not a fool according to his folly. You have to decide. That's what the writer of the Proverbs now If you decide to answer him, you lay yourself open. You may be like him. You may end up being in the same classification. Now, I had that experience recently. I answered a man, a brilliant man, and I thought that he would respond to the answers I gave. Well, I never got such a foolish letter as I did from him. I'm through now because why? Answer a fool according to his folly was my first reaction, lest he be wise in his own conceit. This man had some wrong ideas. And I don't mean that his doctrine was different from mine, but he had some impressions about me that were entirely wrong. I tried to correct them. Well, I made a mistake. Why? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. And I felt very foolish when I got his letter. So there are two lines of conduct, and you have to determine whether you should or shouldn't. Are you willing to put it on the line and be class like that? Now, let's keep reading. Verse 6, "...he that sendeth a message by the hand of a fool cutteth off the feet and drinketh damage." You make a mistake if you send the message by the wrong individual. Verse 7, "...the legs of the lame are not equal, so is a parable in the mouth of fools." Now, I want to tell you, There are certain interpretations of parables that are given today that I feel like I'd like to put that over their interpretation. So is a parable in the mouth of fools. But I better not do that. Verse 8, As he that bindeth a stone in a sling, so is he that giveth honor to a fool. You're just giving him, you know, ammunition. That's all in the world that you're doing. And then, verse 9, "...as a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools." You give a parable to some individuals, and it's just like picking up something, finding that you picked up a rose, but there's a thorn in it. This is a tremendous chapter, is it not? Now it says, "...the great God that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and rewardeth transgressors. And you can be sure of one thing, the ultimate outcome, God will handle this matter and take care of it. Now, we find here something rather frightful. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. And I know of nothing that is as harsh as that. You know, it's repulsive and sickening to even think of this. But you remember that this is the viewpoint that Peter presents to us concerning the hypocrite. The hypocrite, he says that the dog's return to his vomit, and the pig 
Old sows returned to her wallowing again. You see, there was a little pig that left the pig pen and went with the prodigal son. But since he was a pig, he went back to the pig pen. Only sons will go home. And eventually, hypocrites are revealed in the church today. And there are many. There's no question about that. man said to me the other day, he wanted to give us the reason for not joining the church. He says, McGee, the church is filled with hypocrites. Well, I says, no one knows that any better than I do. That's no reason why you shouldn't be in it. You can't hide back of a hypocrite. You should be in there revealing what is genuine. That is the thing that is important. And the important thing to note is, and I've had several letters on this recently from folk that didn't like the fact that we mentioned this, that there is the security of the believer. But I also said there is the insecurity of the make-believer. And that is the thing he's talking about here. Now I'm going to drop down here quite a ways Well, let me pick up verse 12. "...seest thou a man wise in his own conceit, there is more hope of a fool than of him." Now, there is something worse than that, an egomaniac, one that has a high opinion of himself. Then as you move on down, and I'm going to drop down now to verse 20, "...where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail-bearer, the strife ceaseth." The thing that today keeps all the bitterness stirred up in certain groups is the fact that there are just a few in there. They are the ones that keep putting a little something on the fire, you see. If there's no one that like that, then the fire will go out. The strife will cease. And then verse 21, "...as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kennel strife." Certain folk, that the minute that they enter a church or join a church or are in a church at all, they cause strife. You find that in the Lord's work today. They just seem to stir up things all the time. And they're never interested, really, in the Word of God, though they make pretensions. He's mentioned this before here. Now, verse 22, "...the words of a tale-bearer..." are as wounds. Actually, the better translation is, the words of a tale-bearer are dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Now, you may like to hear that little choice bit of gossip. You know, we like to hear that. (laughs) But it's hard to digest. It'll finally make you sick. If you're a child of God, you don't want to hear that ugly thing. And yet a great many people, they like to hear these things. Now, we saw here, and I'm picking up at verse 23 of Proverbs 26, "...burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips, and layeth up deceit with him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations." In his heart, whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. He that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. This is probably one of the longest sections and the strongest sections against hypocrisy. And it means hypocrisy among God's people. And there are those that make a profession of faith. After all, the hypocrite in the church and the hypocrite among God's people should not disturb those inside or those outside for the very fact that they do not counterfeit $1 bills. They do counterfeit $20. They only counterfeit that which is valuable. And no one, as I know, is making counterfeit pennies. The thing is that these things are to be noted, recognized, and then the warning is given here. It's against those that are two-faced. Those that will come to you, say one thing to your face, they say something 
to you back. They flatter you, and yet in their hearts they hate you. It was Tacitus who made the statement, it is common for man to hate those whom they have injured. And when you find out that someone has injured you, you can be sure of one thing, it's because he hates you. That hatred is in the heart. You have that example of flattery in the Bible in Haman. You remember how he flattered, and yet this man plotted to destroy an entire people, and even that would encompass and take in the queen upon the throne. Evil man, a man that flattered the king, and yet it was obvious that he was planning to overthrow the king. This is something that you find in Christian circles, and we need to recognize it. There's no use covering over. There's probably no place in the world where there is all of this cover-up as there is in the church. We try to act like it's not there, that somehow or another, if we ignore it, it'll go away. We feel like our church is defeated if anybody mentions the fact there's a hypocrite around. We feel like we and ourselves are defeated if we acknowledge that even in our own hearts there's this root of bitterness sometime. So that I think Christians need to face up. And these Proverbs are very good at making us face up. 